Marianne, if I'm not, please tell me. I have my phone here so she can text me. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with y'all, and I apologize for the last minute change in plans. Originally, I was going to tape this and post it at eight o'clock this morning, but um, earlier this week, I ended up um, I had to take to my mother to the emergency room, and I guess that's something that, you know, I hope to never have to say. I had to take my mother to the emergency room, so it was kind of a stressful day. They ended up releasing her about four o'clock in the morning. She Her blood pressure shot up uh, due to some medication that she's on, and she gave us a scare, but she's back home now, and she's fine. Well, she's, she's stabilized, so anyway... Um, that's why, you know, my whole week has just been completely discombobulated by that. And of course, being up late and all that um, kind of had, took its toll. So anyway, here we are. And I have my list of questions. Marianne went through the group and, and kind of gathered them up. And I have a few that you guys emailed me. And um, I'm going to get to those in just a second. But first, I want to say two things. One is, I'm going to tell you all a secret. I've never shared this, I don't think. Um, every time I do a live video, I sit here for about 10 minutes and fluff my hair and look at myself because I'm not used to being on camera. And so I, I, now I'm like, okay, this eyebrow is different from this eyebrow. And I'm sitting here doing this, you know, on the camera and trying to, you know, make sure that everything <laughs> trying to make sure I'm all put together before I hit that go live button or that record button. And it's really comical. I thought about taping that as, as an outtake, and then I decided perhaps that was not a good career move because I looked a little nutty, but um, I couldn't resist sharing that because I think it just shows how critical we all are of ourselves, and I just sit here and criticize every little thing, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm never going to get this done if I keep this up, so anyway, that was funny. That was the first thing. The second thing is um, thank you all so much for all of your wonderful posts this month. I appreciate so much everyone who read one of the List Talbot titles during January. Um, it was Reader's Choice for Book of the Month, and you guys just really um, showed me the love in the group with your post. Um, I loved looking at them and hearing what you guys thought, and I really do appreciate all of you who read and love the Liz Talbot Mysteries, and I especially like the picture from Barnes & Noble with all the books, um, and, and I love that display. That was the Hilton Head Barnes & Noble, and several people asked, well, I thought, you know, that these books weren't available in bookstores, and, and they are. Really, any bookstore can order them for you. Some bookstores stock them. It's just not the whole Barnes & Noble chain doesn't. Uh, individual Barnes and Nobles do, and I never know uh, who's going to have them and, and who's not. Typically, ones in the South are more likely to have them, and bookstores that I've visited are more likely to have them. I've been to the Hilton Head store a couple of times, signed books. It's been a few years, but I, I have been there and signed books, and so I think, you know, there there's a readership for my books in that store, so they stock them. So, I guess the moral of that story is if, if you ask for them, wherever you are, they'll probably order one for you. If a few people ask for them, maybe they'll stock a few and see how they do. And if they become something that readers in that area enjoy, then they'll order some more. But they're always available through Barnes & Noble online and also through Fiction Addiction, through Buxton Books, many other independent bookstores, and of course, Amazon and all those places. So, now to the questions. I'm sorry for all of that. You know, I don't do anything short-winded. I tend to go off on tangents. Y'all know that about me by now. Um, and so I apologize. So here we are. Um, I don't know, three minutes and 45 seconds into things. And I'm finally getting to the point, which are your questions. Now, some of these folks emailed to me and some of them were posted in the group. And the first one was emailed to me after my newsletter came out last week. I typically try to send those out on Thursdays, the week before we have some sort of live event, because that kind of reminds folks. So if you are subscribed to the newsletter, you get a reminder a week in advance, you know, to come here for this. So Trudy uh, emailed me back and said, who is Sugar? <laughs> because in my, in my newsletter, I had said uh, that Sugar and I were on this new eating plan, I think, the, the whole food plant-based thing. And um, Sugar, of course, is my husband, Jim. And, um, you know, I, I probably don't remind folks of that because I'm so used to calling him that. Um, but anyway, that's one of many uh, pet names that I have for him, and that's the one I most commonly use. So if you hear me talk about sugar, that's my husband, Jim, and he is, he's my sugar. Okay, so Patricia wants to know, she says, I have a question for our book club. 
ask you anything interview. It's really a two-part question. Excellent. I love two-part questions. Number one, when you were writing the first book, Low Country Bowl, did you envision it as a series right away? Yes, I always knew this would be a series. And that's one reason it took me so long to get that first book written because I knew that I was anchoring a series. I had to get that right. I couldn't change my mind about things four books in or five books in. So it took me a long time to get that right. And I'll just say this now. Many of you know that I'm working on a, a new series, a new character, Hadley Cooper, who is another private investigator who is in the Charleston area, uh, but has a completely different backstory and, and background and life experience from Liz Talbot. Um, and, and they will not exist in each other's worlds at all. There will be no crossover. They will be completely different. In, in Hadley Cooper's world, there is no Stella Mars. So with her, we're going to be a little more grounded in reality. But, but back to the point, tangent again, um, back to the point, I, uh, I'm, I'm taking a lot of time with Hadley now because, again, I know that I'm anchoring a series. I know that there are going to be several books, at least, in Hadley's series and also a spinoff novel uh, with some of the other characters. So I have a lot of plans for Hadley and I want to make sure that I have this right because you can't change a main character several books in. You've got to make sure you have her just like you want her before you let that first one go. So I'm taking a lot of extra time with Hadley right now, just the way I did with Liz in the beginning. I'm not going to take quite as much time with Hadley as I took with Liz, but that's what's taking me so long, is, is I have to get this right. Okay, uh, Patricia's second question. In the first book, there are several potential love interests for Liz. Scott the Scoundrel, not seriously. Michael Devlin, and then vaguely in the background, Nate Andrews. How far ahead did you plan for how it would work out? In other words, did you see Liz and Nate together in more than a professional sense from the beginning, or did the idea evolve over the first three books? Well, Patricia, here's how this happened. In the beginning, when I was first writing Low Country Boil, my intention was to was for Liz to move home and rekindle a romance with her high school and college love, uh, Michael Devlin. So I intended for Michael to be her love interest in the beginning. I did not realize that I was writing Michael Devlin um, in such a negative light. Early on, um, I, I learned more about that character as I was writing him. And as it ended up, I didn't like him and I did not want Liz to be with him. I did not like Liz with him. I mean, he's an okay character. He just wasn't what I wanted for Liz. And I didn't really realize that until I had com completely written that book. And so I, I was a little unsure at the end of the first book because I had just figured this out that Nate was really gonna be Liz's future and Michael was not. And so I had written the whole book with, you know, sort of Michael in mind. So I had to kind of resolve that. I had to kind of figure that out, explain that to myself and then to my readers. So um, I kind of left it open at the end of book one. And then um, I, I kind of decided then that it was going to be Nate. And I, but I did not want to resolve that all in one book. But I also did not want to have the kind of series, and, and some people do this very successfully, and I do not mean any sort of a slam in any way towards these hugely successful people who do this, but I did not want to write a book where for an entire 20-some-odd books, the main character was trying to decide between two or three men, because that is not real to me. Now, now you might say, but a ghost is, because there's some things clearly in there that are, you know, a little more real than others. But um, I, it was not, it did not resonate with me that that, that would be real, that a, a woman would do that. Um, and some things I needed to be real about, and, and this was one of them. I wanted Liz to have a very solid relationship. I wanted it to be resolved within the first three or four books so that, you know, we could have her happily ever after and not have that completely always be in suspension, you know, suspended and, you know, it was in um, limbo. We were never going to really know how this came because that just was not real to me. Women, most women I know do not live that way. So I needed to resolve that because each book I wanted to be a self-contained mystery. I wanted the focus to be on the mystery, but also the ongoing character stories but I did not want Liz's romantic life to always be in limbo. So it sort of evolved to answer your question, Patricia. 
Um, so Catherine wants to know what research did Susan do in order to write about PIs? This was fun. This was a lot of fun. So I read The Idiot's Guide to Private Investigation. I still have that book somewhere in here. Um, and, and a couple other PI books. Um, and, and I made notes. I highlighted things. I put in the, the, the sticky notes and all that. And then I interviewed a couple of PIs. I talked to one. There was one in my local writers group at the time. And then um, eventually I, I approached a PI about reading uh, a galley of one of my books. He actually read um, the third book, Low Country Boneyard. And after he read it, I, I said to him, does this seem real to you? Does the private investigator detail seem real to you? And he said, oh yeah, it all, it all seems very real. You know, you did a good job. He said, right up until the point where they get on the ferry to Stella Morris. Now, you know, that's not real, right? Because this guy lived in Charleston and he was very familiar with the landscape and knew that uh, there was no Stella Morris, not really. You have to get, you can only get there by boat. Okay, so um, I, I did a lot of research and I really enjoyed that. I also research a lot of things online and I'll touch more on that in a minute. Um, Catherine always wants to, or also wants to know, is Susan working on another novel in the series? Is there an ETA for release? So Catherine, um, Hadley right now is taking all of my time and, and that's the way, you know, new children are. Um, so I need to get Hadley's first book finished and I apologize, I'm dragging my feet on that. But as soon as I finish that, I, I do know what Liz's next story is going to be and I will write that next. And I know this sounds very ambitious, especially with everything else I have going on in my life right now. But um, I plan to have Hadley's first story uh, at least to my agent so that she can do, you know, what she's going to do with that um, and then get back to Liz and get Liz's first um, book out or next book out to you guys later this year. Um, that, that, I, that is my plan is to have a new Liz book later this year. I don't have a date. I don't know exactly how long that's going to take, but my goal is ambitious this year. I want to get Hadley settled, get her first book done and get Liz's next book out. Um, something else that will happen with Liz later in the year um, is that the first book in the series, Low Country Boyle, um, I get the rights back to that series uh, or to the first book in that series later this year. Um, and so she will be getting a new home, uh, at least in that first book, Liz. So um, we'll, we'll see how that, that plays out. But at this point, I believe what I'm going to do because I have so many friends who are doing this and they swear by it, and, and so I'm, my, my new series, um, I'm going to see what my agent can do with that, but the Liz books, as I get them back, and it'll be about one a year, um, I'm, I think I'm going to start my own little uh, imprint and, and just put those books back out and, and make sure that they're always available for new readers, um, and I'll have more information on that later in the year. Okay, so yes, more Liz later this year. Hang in there with me, please. Um, Okay, so Chrissy wants to know, I'm reading Low Country Boneyard for the month. Does Susan have a favorite character in the series? Hey, Chrissy. Um, so I, I do, and I thought about this. Um, actually, they're all my favorites, but I think if I had to pick one favorite, it would be Nate. Um, and the reason for that is because Sugar, Jim, the love of my life, um, I have put a lot of him into Nate. And so he is my favorite character. And I sometimes, my, uh, my husband will be talking and he'll say something that I find humorous or that I like or, or whatever. And I just, I'm like, hold on a minute, I got to write. And I'm typing into my phone. I have a list of things that he says that I find appealing or, or smart or, or witty or whatever. And I write them down and, and I later give them to Nate to say. So there's a lot of my husband in Nate. So he's my favorite character. Um, I like Liz a lot, too. There's a lot of me in her, but, but yeah, Nate, he's special to me. Um, okay, Susan Brauner would like to know, I hope I said that name right, Susan. Um, I love the electronic equipment that Liz and Nate use in their investigations. Where does Susan get the ideas for those gadgets? Now, now I'll go back and talk about the Internet some more, because I was talking about research on the Internet, and I did research some of the PI uh, stuff on the internet, but also the gadgets. All of that came from the internet, and I stumbled on this stuff quite by accident as I was Googling in the beginning some of the PI detail. I, I ran across these stores. Y'all would not believe what you can buy online in these stores. Um, there's all kinds of listening devices, all kinds of gadgets to help you spy on people. 
all kinds of things. And then, and don't get me started on, you know, the whole weapons thing and all that, but I learned a lot about, um, you know, the gun that Liz carries and, and different things like that offline. So um, I, I get a lot of that stuff from the internet, but there are all kinds of spy stores that have all these cool gadgets in them. And I just thought, what fun. Um, now, some of that stuff is probably highly illegal, highly illegal, but you know, this is fiction and I'm having fun. I hope y'all are. Okay, so um, we're on page two. Wanda would like to know, does she actually go to restaurants she writes about and try the foods? I know the crack pot isn't real, but the others all sound amazing. Wanda, I do this for y'all. I take my research very, very seriously. If Liz Talbot goes to a restaurant, I have been to that restaurant. I ordered what she ordered and I liked it very much. And I wanted to make sure all the details were right. I probably took pictures while I was there and posted them somewhere on the internet. I've done a lot of that on uh, Pinterest and, and Facebook and, and Instagram and different places. So um, yes, I, I do go to all those places. Now, there were times during the pandemic uh, when I have not been able to go. And so some of that was either based on memory or, um, you know, some some other research. But um, for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, if Liz Talbot's in a restaurant, I've been there and I loved it. And Charleston has so many great restaurants. So what a great perk, right? I love this job. Um, so Catherine wants to know, for a low country bombshell, where did you come up with the idea to use Marilyn Monroe? Catherine, I have always been fascinated by Marilyn Monroe. Um, and I guess it's just one of those things that captured my imagination early on. I've always been curious, you know, about what happened to her and the, the story and the history and all that. So um, I, I was just, it was something that was interesting to me. And so I thought, I can't write about Marilyn Monroe, but what about someone who is possibly connected to her uh, and and so I came up with this whole idea of you know it, and initially it was going to be someone who was you know descended but I didn't have the doppelganger idea until later and so or, or someone who was related you know but but then um, I came up with with the idea for a doppelganger and really thought I could have some fun with that and I did I, I had a lot of fun with that book um, so it's just something I was always interested in. And, and because of that, I had to make that book exactly 50 years after Marilyn had died. That was a plot point. So I, that kind of messed with my timeline a little bit. But anyway, okay. Did you research your life and come up with the idea as a result? Or did you research your life after coming, life with, after coming up with the idea? So I, I think I answered that. I, um, I was interested in her. And then I, I researched her life quite thoroughly. Um, I read... Um, there's a, a Donald Spoto wrote a, a autobi or not, yeah a biography of Marilyn Monroe, and it's extremely thorough and very well doc documented. And I, I read uh, the Marilyn Monroe Treasures. I did a lot of research online, but those two books, uh, Donald Spoto's biography and um, the the Marilyn Monroe Treasures, I, I got a lot of information from both of those, um, and really enjoyed that research a lot. It's fascinating. Okay, Maureen Cook, when can we expect the next installment? Maureen, I'm working on it as fast as I can, and I hope to have it to you later this year. That's my plan. Realistically, it will probably be sometime in the fall, um, just because I've got to get Hadley straightened out and hand it off to my agent, and then uh, get Liz straightened out and, um, and get her, her next book out. But I'm working on it. It's coming. Okay, so <laughs> Marianne wants to know, will the vegetable soup that was called Divine in Bows of Folly ever be shared by Tallulah or maybe Moon Unit needs to give her permission to share it. Marianne, I have thought about that soup and, and honestly, this is one thing because it was in the crack pot, which is of course a fictional restaurant. So I actually thought of this soup, um, but had not written about this soup or excuse me, have not eaten this soup. I had not had this soup. This was something I dreamed up and thought, okay, there's got to be this really good vegetable soup. And so then after that, I started looking for recipes for really good vegetable soup. And I've tried a few and I've experimented, you know, with my own recipes, adding things and all that. And when I come up with a vegetable soup, 
that I like as much as my characters liked that vegetable soup, then Tallulah will share that recipe with everybody. But I'm working on it. And since I'm doing this whole food plant-based thing and vegetables are my life now, um, probably it will come sooner rather than labor, later. So you can look for that in an upcoming newsletter. Okay, um, Megan has a couple of questions. Thank you, Megan. Um, just finished Low Country Boondoggle and just noticed all the words in each title start with a B. Is there a reason? So Megan, here's what happened there. I always knew that the first book in the series was going to be Low Country Boil. I had that title picked out and I really felt good about that title and, and that was going to be the book. And Fortunately, my publisher agreed. They liked the title too. Um, the second book, because of the Marilyn Monroe tie-in, Low Country Bombshell was a good title for that. So I had, you know, a, a title for the second book. And then I realized I had a pattern going. And so uh, one day my agent called and said, your publisher wants to put books three and four under contract. Do you have outlines? And I said, no. And she said, do you have a synopsis? And I said, no. And she said, what about a title? And I said, let me call you back. So I pulled out the dictionary and I flipped through to the BO words and I found words that I thought would make good titles. And I called her back and I said, they're going to be Boneyard and Bordello. And she laughed and thought those were good titles. And from that point on, I started collecting words that started with BO. When I would go and talk to people at a luncheon or at a book club meeting or a book festival or whatever, I would ask the group, you know, if you have words that start with BO that you think would make a good title, then um, send them to me. So I saved a list and that's where the rest of the titles came. Now, I think I have exhausted all of my really great titles that start with BO. And so 10 books in, the series is at somewhat of a turning point. If you read all the way to Bowels of Holly, you kind of maybe know what I'm talking about here. Um, and so the next book in the series will still be Low Country, but that second word is going to be something that does not start with a B.O. It's probably going to be Low Country Lies. Um, that's the book that I was kind of thinking about before I went off on this whole Hadley tangent. Um, and so I, I think the next book will be Low Country Lies. And the the reason is I, I need some more flexibility in titles. Um, I, I, the, the titles became for me for a while the, the writing prompt, you know. So now I've got Low Country Boneyard. What's that book going to be about? And, and this was great to an extent, but um, I, I've, I've exhausted that and I need to kind of move on to something a little broader. So we'll keep the Low Country, but we're going to go to, to something different for that second word. Okay, Megan's second question. Where do you come up with the shenanigans that Liz's dad are, is always a part of? I absolutely love them. Thank you, Megan. I love daddy. Um, so, okay. Um, in the beginning, um, all right, y'all. Uh, some of y'all know this. Liz's parents are not my parents. I do not write about real people. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But those characters were suggested by my parents. Some of the things that my parents say and do make them make their way into Liz's parents. Uh, my mother always told me, honey, you feel so much better if you just put on a little lipstick, okay? And my dad does the crazy things that end up on the page with Liz's dad, to a point. Now, the thing in Low Country Boneyard with the rats, my dad absolutely did that. That is 100% True story, it happened the day my sister brought my the man who is now, God bless him, my brother-in-law home for the first time, that happened exactly like I wrote it. Um, well, okay, I was a little less involved than Liz is, but, but that happened. Um, now, some of the other shenanigans that daddy does, absolutely my dad did. He gives me great fodder and I love him for it. He is a hysterical man. Some of the things, you know, I thought up out of whole cloth, but I could imagine them happening with my dad. Um, the, the scene in Low Country Bookshop, if y'all have read that, that I made up. If that had happened, my mother would have divorced my father. She would have left. That would have been the end of that. <laughs> but I think she would have, that would have been the straw that broke the camel's back right there. So um, that that did not happen. I made that up, but it's based on many years, decades of, of history of watching this man and the crazy things that he does. Now, my dad is not Liz's dad. Their, their background, their story, their, their 
everything about them. It's, it's not my dad, but there's a lot of similarities there. You know, some of the things he says and some of the things he does make their way onto the page. And he will never know because he does not read novels. He reads magazines and newspapers. And, you know, my mom gets a kick out of it. So, and I do too. I have fun with it. So um, that's suggested by real life. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what or who inspired the name Moon Unit? It's definitely unique. <laughs> okay. So um, I was in a writer's group in Greenville, South Carolina, and um, I was working on Low Country Boil, the first book in the series. And I had named uh, the, the woman in the uh, cracked pot, the woman who owned the cracked pot, I had named her Oh, wow. I can't remember what I had named her, but it was some mundane character name. It was not, um, if I think long enough and hard enough about it, maybe I'll remember. I named her something else. And someone in my writing group uh, who was reading my pages, we read five pages a week. We each read five pages and we all talked about them. And that is so helpful if you're uh, writing. That's so helpful. So we all talked about each other's pages. And somebody said to me, you know, these characters have, they all have these traditional Southern names. They all have these, you know, sort of run of the mill names or, or names we've all heard of. Why don't you name one of them something crazy, something outlandish? And so I started thinking about Frank Zappa and, you know, I don't know where this came from, but Frank Zappa and his children, um, uh, Dweezil and Moon Unit, I think they are. And so I, I decided that I would uh, use Moon Unit and, and say that her father liked Frank Zappa. And then I would name her brother Elvis, a little Elvis, and that her mother liked Elvis Presley. And so they each got to name one child. And so I made that part of the story. So not only did I change her name, um, I, I get it, it added to the story. Um, I doing that added to the story and that was a lot of fun. So it sort of helped me develop those characters a little more, um, her parents. Okay, so next page, Karen would like to know. My question is, do you like Pinot Noir as much as Liz and are these your favorite wines that they drink? Uh, yes, uh, in the beginning, uh, early in the series, Liz drank Pinot Noir because that at the time was my favorite red wine. I love red wine. Um, I also like champagne quite a lot as does Liz uh, and margaritas <laughs> as does Liz um, and you know a few other things. But um, Pinot Noir was what I preferred for many years, and so Liz drank that. Um, later in the series, um, I think they start drinking red blends because my taste sort of evolved over time, and now I like red blends um, and cabs even, uh, uh, bourbon barrel aged cabs and, and red blends are my favorite right now. So for a while, it was Pinot Noir, and so were Liz's because, you know, you've probably heard me say she's my avatar, um, and my taste evolved, so hers did too. Um, Okay, Sarah Coffin, uh, having fun with the start of my journey with Liz and Low Country Boil. Questions. Mama gives a lot of practical advice. What is Liz's favorite momism? So I guess it would have to be the lipstick one. Honey, you'll feel so much better if you just put on a little lipstick. Uh, but there, there's rich territory there. And, and a lot of those things come from my mom. So, you know, again, my parents. My parents are not Liz's parents, but they're suggested by them. And so a lot of things that mom says are things my mother has said to me. And that's where they came from. If y'all hear a noise, it's my robot vacuum cleaner. And it's coming this way. And I forgot to turn it off. And I'm sorry about that. I don't think it'll be very loud, but I can hear him coming. Okay. Um, let's see. Did you make a deliberate decision about the level of danger that Liz will encounter? Um, you know, I, I, I didn't really draw a line there. I kind of wanted her to push uh, the boundaries. I wanted her to, to have risk in her job. I wanted her to uh, kind of go out there and do some of those things, you know, that were a little off the charts. Like in, in the first book, I have her uh, jumping from a running jet ski into a moving boat while someone is shooting at her. That's pretty dangerous. So I, I really decided that I wanted her to be, you know, a, a very competent PI, but one who also uh, 
you know, was, was in danger. And because she was going to knowingly put herself in danger, I decided early on that she could not be a mother because that did not feel real to me. That if as a mother that I would have small children at home, but I would go out at night and be on stakeout and, and put myself in that kind of danger. Um, not to say that some women don't have very dangerous jobs who are great mothers, they do. Um, and, and I don't mean anything about them. I'm just talking about for me. For me, that was um, that was what felt true. And, and Liz is my avatar. So no kids for Liz, even though I myself have four. Um, okay. So I'm sorry, I lost my place. Okay, Sandra wants to know, just finished Low Country Basil Folly. I really enjoy these books and cannot wait for the next Liz and Nate adventures. Um, my question is, are all the characters going to continue on in the series or will we see some life changes coming for some of them? Sandra, um, all of the characters that I currently have on the page will continue to be there. In some books, there will be more of some of them than others. Um, so... For example, you know, um, Blake and Poppy have just gotten married and um, Blake's, uh, and, and they're expecting their first child. So, you know, you may see a little less of Blake and Poppy um, because some of that's going to happen off the page because the thing about kids is they can take over a book really quickly um, and these are mysteries and I need to keep the pace going. And so I probably will use uh, the child sparingly, the, the children as they come sparingly, um, because I can't take the focus off the mystery too much. And that's the constant juggle with the characters and, and the mystery is that I need to keep the story, the main story of the book, the mystery moving forward so that we don't get bogged down, but then have just enough of the family interaction in there and, and the townspeople that you get that sense of, of returning to a place, you know, to visit and, and, and to see characters that you know and love and spend time with them. But I can't have those parts of the book bog it down too much. I have to keep that pace going. So in some books, you will see less of some characters because I can only have so many of these sort of scenes that have family interaction in them uh, because I have to keep the mystery moving forward. So if I only have, you know, two or three scenes with these family and, and townspeople in them, uh, especially if the book is set in Charleston as opposed to On Sale of Mars. Now, if it's set there like in Bowles of Holly, the whole book is there or most of the book is there. And so I, I can work in more, but can put the scenes in the crack pot or in the police station or wherever um, and work in more of the townsfolk and, and some of their stories and have that still move the story forward. But I can't go too far off onto these little side stories and update uh, what's going on with too many characters in one book. So you'll see, I'll kind of rotate them. There'll, there'll be you know a few of them in this book and maybe we'll have a little of, of uh, Blake and a little of Mary, but maybe it'll be more of Blake in this book and less of Mary. And then uh, the one book, my sister fussed at me because I sent Mary to Charles or to Charlotte for a book and, um, and she wasn't in there much. So anyway, um, because, you know, Mary is Liz's sister and my sister, it's not my sister. My sister is not Mary. I keep telling her that. Anyway, um, so you'll see more of characters in some books and less in others, but all of them I, I plan to have there. I'm not planning to kill any of the main characters off or anything like that. Um, I like them too much. Also, some of them, you know, remind me of other family members. If, never mind, we won't go there. Um, okay, so Sylvia wants to know, was Liz's daddy always when she was growing up as quirky as he is now, it would be an interesting read for her to think back in some future writings to some funny situations when she was a child or teenager. I've read all the series, but do not recall if he revealed when his different behavior started. I do remember in the first book, Liz got to check on him at a shop after her mother asked her to go. So Liz's daddy has always been a little nutty um, ever since he was uh, conceived in my brain and, and, and brought to the page. He's always been fully formed, uh, a little nutty um, and, and a little um, 
you know, unpredictable and, and he's done these crazy things because that's just the character. So he's always had that in him. Um, will I go back and, and talk about crazy things he did when she was a child? Maybe. I don't know. It depends if it serves the story or not. I think uh, if I can work in something, and, and I usually have at least one daddy scene in each book where he does something, you know, a little off the walls. Um, and, and I try to do that because I think most of my readers enjoy those. Um, but I probably will not have time to go back and talk about things he did when she was growing up, except maybe just a sentence or two. And, and I think I have a time or two said a sentence or two about something that he did that, that stuck in her memory. And I, I can't really think of a good example of that, but it, it just feels like I have done that and mentioned things. Um, there, there was a, uh, uh, when I'm talking in Low Country Bookshop about one of the characters who um, Liz's dad has working on the pool, I mentioned something, I think I do it in this book, I mentioned something that happened when she was a child. So it just her dad bringing this guy around who did crazy things, so bringing somebody even nuttier around. Um, but I try to also work in moments of lucidity for him so that you know he's not just completely off the rails. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not sure that we'll talk about too much about what she did uh, or what he did when she was younger, maybe a sentence or two here or there, but, but I do want to have at least one daddy scene in each book. So Chrissy wants to know, what inspired Bookshop? It was the most intricate mystery. Chrissy, I'm so happy you enjoyed it. Um, so Bookshop was probably the first book I wrote when I really wanted to write something else. Um, what I had in my head, I wanted to write the story about these women who were working together to, uh, and to support one another and, and, and who were fighting uh, domestic abuse. I wanted to write about women. I wanted to write about domestic abuse. I really wanted to write at that point a women's fiction book that had a mystery in it, not a mystery about women. So, and there's a difference. It's like the mystery would not be the, the main focus. It would be there, but not the main focus. But the main focus would be the women, their relationships, how they interacted with each other, how they supported each other. That's the book I wanted to write. But I was under contract for a mystery and I needed to turn that in. So I turned the book that I wanted to write and it took me a long time to, to do this. And this book was, you know, I was like on deadline and I was like never going to get this done because... It started out, it was going to, Bookshop was going to be a Christmas story, and it was going to have these women in it, and, and so I had part of it written, and I ended up having to go back and, and change it and put it in a different time of the year, and then, um, you know, it, 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 it evolved over time, and then I went back and wrote that Christmas story in Bows of Holly, but um, the idea came to me... I, Chrissy, I'll be honest, it was probably something in the news. I really don't remember, but there was something that, that got me thinking about domestic violence. And um, that got me wanting to write about that and about how women cope with that and support each other. And and I really kind of wanted to write a um, a uh, sort of like a, a hero, women, you know, being each other's heroes kind of thing and, and you know, girl power and that kind of thing. I wanted to do to do that. And so it turned into bookshop because that's the book I had to write. And, um, you know, some of these things, you know, I'll probably touch on again in a different book. And I will write that women's fiction book that I've had in my head for a while, but it's, it's going to be a little further down the line because I can't get all this stuff done as fast as I would like. I wish I could clone myself some days. Um, okay. So Betty wants to know which character do you find the easiest to write about? Betty, I thought about this, and, and your next question, who was the hardest, I thought about both of those, um, and, and I think this is probably not a satisfying answer, but it's the truth. Um, the easiest character for me to write is Liz, because she's my avatar. She thinks like I do. Um, she has this a, a very similar background to my background, not completely the same, but very similar, and, um, you know, she she's just my imaginary me, my, my avatar, my, me in a younger, thinner, uh, all of that, you know, in, in an alternate universe, that would be me. Um, and so she's the easiest for me to write, but she's also the hardest for me to write because when I go back and I go to editing, um, I, I always, you know, I, I want Liz to be very clear about what she's thinking. And sometimes I put things on the page and 
then I read it and I think, oh, it sounds like she meant this, but what she really meant was that. And so I'm constantly editing Liz to make sure that she comes across the way I intend for her to come across. And I wish that I had the ability to edit everything that comes out of my mouth the way I can edit what comes out of Liz's mouth, because sometimes you realize, and I think this is just human, you know, you realize that what you said and, and what you intended uh, were not the way it was received because of maybe you didn't word it exactly the way you meant to or the way you should have or whatever. That happens to me all the time. I feel like I'm, I'm misunderstood. And so I want to make sure that sometimes, like everybody, not, not any more than the average person, but um, I want to make sure that Liz is understood. And so I, I try to get that right. I tweak that and I can get into overthinking that a little bit too much. So and you know what, if you overthink things too long, you screw it up. So the, the battle is to not overthink Liz too much and to just let Liz be Liz and, and not micromanage her too much. So that is all the questions that I have. I am going to scroll down through here and see if I see anything else. Um, I do not, oh. Uh, Carrie would like to know, do you belong to an in-person book club? And I did uh, in Greenville and, um, you know, I, I miss my book club so much. Um, I had one, we had one in our, in our neighborhood, uh, several friends that lived in that neighborhood and we would meet once a month and it was a lot of fun and I miss it dearly. Um, I have not joined one here. Um, I'm not sure, I, I just really don't have the time right now for that, um, unfortunately, but um, I do hope to get back to an in-person book club soon. I love them a lot. I love book clubs. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here. I do not see, oh, uh, Claudia. I love Liz's parents, the one about the pig her dad put in the backyard. How did you come up with her mom and dad? Claudia, they were suggested by my parents, um, but they are wildly fictionalized. Um, let's see. Michael did turn out not to be a good person, didn't he? He he is he's not a bad person, but he's not uh, he's not who I wanted for Liz. He he's he's a little more uh, you know he's 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 just not what I wanted for Liz. Nate turns out to be exactly what I wanted for Liz, and you know it it's interesting because when I wrote Michael, because I thought he was going to be Liz's love interest, you know. I kind of gave him the physical characteristics of my husband. He was tall and he had dark hair and, and warm brown eyes and that's my husband. Uh, well, at least his hair was dark. <laughs> I turned it gray, but uh, it was dark. And um, so then when I decided it was gonna be Nate, I had to give Nate a different physical description to differentiate the characters. And so Nate ends up being someone who looks nothing like my husband, but he is very much like my husband inside. So. I have a lot of fun with Nate, but I do wish that I had figured all that out so that I could have given him, you know, a, a different description, but we are where we are. And, and, and that's the thing you learn as you write the series and you develop the characters book by book that once you have it on the page and once it's out there and people have read it, that's who the character is. And so it's hard to go back. I mean, people do change and characters can change. Um, but it's hard. It's, it's hard to go back and change them. You can't do something that's completely out of character. And once you have all of that information on the page, I mean, I literally keep, and when I say I keep, what I really mean is Marianne keeps a spreadsheet of all the different things for all the different characters, their description, what their favorite thing to eat is, their favorite thing to drink, you know, what it looks like, where they live, what they drive, all the different things, because you would not believe how easily you lose track of these things. And I want to make sure that I don't publish a book that has things in it that are inconsistent with the last book. You know, I can't forget, um, you know, what Liz is driving, you know, and, and, and if she's changed vehicles this last book and she, she changed vehicles, I think two books ago. Um, so I have to remember what she's driving and, and, uh, and all that. So it's a lot of fun. I have a wonderful, wonderful time writing these books. It's, it's delicious fun, uh, making things up and writing them down. I said that to my dad yesterday. Um, I went to see mom and dad and I had taken dad, uh, out to check the mail. We, we go to the post office to check the mail because he says he, he has to check the mail. Someone might send him a check. 
and all he ever gets is junk mail. And so he got back in the car. He was disgusted. He threw away the piece of junk mail. And I said, Dad, who is it that you think might be sending you a check? And he said, well, I don't care who sends it. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Anyway, um, we were driving around in the car and uh, I said, he said, well, come in and, you know, hang out for a while. And I said, you know, I've got to go home. I've got to get some work done. Got to make some things up and write them down. And he said, well, I guess that's not too bad of a job, is it? And I'm like, it really is the best job ever. I love it. And thank you all so much for making it possible for me to do the thing that I love so much every day. I really appreciate y'all because without you, I would not have a job and I'm very appreciative. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions, especially for reading the books, for hanging out with me here in the book club and being a part of Low Country Book Club, for subscribing to my newsletter and, you know, responding and telling me what's new with you, for all the things that you do, for being a part of my routine, of my day, of my life. Thank you so much, all of you. I appreciate you. All right. I think we are, we addressed all the questions um, and I am going to go back to work, make some things up, write some things down and get you guys some books out. Thank you so much for being patient with me. This has been fun. All right. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.